45 minutes. Come on, man. Two hours later. Psych class, I told you guys I would not leave you hanging on the introductions. I hope you enjoyed it. Welcome back for another unit review, this time on Unit 4, Learning. In this unit review, we will focus on three important aspects of learning. We are going to start off with classical conditioning. We will take a look at some of the history behind classical conditioning by looking at research done by physiologist Ivan Pavlov and psychologist John B. Watson. We're going to see how reflexive behavior can be associated with a neutral stimulus, and we will end our discussion on classical conditioning with some talks about its contemporary uses. Then we will move on to operant conditioning. We will take a look at some of the works of B.F. Skinner to see how reinforcement or punishment can lead to a voluntary behavior change. And we will also talk about some of the contemporary views on operant conditioning. And we will end our Unit 4 review with cognitive learning. Here we will take a look at observational learning with the Bobo the Doll experiment, and we will also take a look at some other forms of cognitive learning. And before we move on, please make sure you are following along with the video review packet. Like I always say, I promise you will thank me when you have it all finished. It will help you a lot keeping yourself organized and making sure you have all the information you need. So let's get started. Learning is going to be a semi-permanent change in behavior that is going to be brought on by experience or practice. With many great scientific advancements, oftentimes they are discovered by chance or circumstance. A very well-known example of this is Sir Isaac Newton hypothesizing his theory of gravity based off of him observing an apple fall from a tree in his apple orchard to the ground. Because of a widespread plague, Newton was forced to stay home leading to the circumstance of the apple falling. This observation of the apple falling is what led to Newton hypothesizing his theory of gravity. Physics has Newton, while well, psychology has Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov, a Russian physiologist, did not even consider himself a psychologist, and he would probably get pretty offended if you called him one because psychology was not the most respected field at the time. As a physiologist, Pavlov studied concepts and ideas on how the body systems work together and what effects outside stimuli have on the human body. In the 1890s, Pavlov was studying digestion. In doing so, he would present a dog with a meat-based powder. Pavlov would then insert a test tube into the cheek of the dog in order to measure the amount of saliva that the dog produced. Pavlov's hypothesis that when the dogs were presented with an outside stimulus, such as food, the stimulus would cause the dogs to salivate. But here's where our twist comes in. Pavlov eventually found that the dogs would start to salivate even before they saw the food. They would actually start to salivate just from the footsteps of the assistants who brought them the food. When Pavlov discerned that any object or event which the dogs learned to associate food with would trigger the same response, he realized that he had made a breakthrough in the science behind how we learn and devoted the rest of his career in studying this type of learning. In 1902, Pavlov really started to amp up his research. Pavlov found that some behaviors are inborn and do not need to be learned, such as the dogs salivating to the meat. These behaviors are hardwired into the organism's brain. In the terms of behavioral psychology, this would be our unconditioned stimulus, while salivating is the unconditioned response. What that means is, all of these behaviors actually occur before we actually learn anything. The dogs don't need to be taught to salivate as a result of seeing food. That's just an inborn instinctual behavior. In his experiment, Pavlov wanted to see if he could get a neutral stimulus to produce a conditioned response. In psychology, a stimulus is any object or event that elicits a sensory or behavioral response. So that means that a neutral stimulus is just going to be a stimulus that initially produces no response. In his experiment, Pavlov used a metronome as his neutral stimulus. A metronome it's just one of those things that go like 
But anyways, now if we were to take the metronome to the dog for the first time and play the sound, chances are, other than the dog maybe being curious as to where the sound came from, we won't see much of a response. What Pavlov discovered was that when he presents the food and the metronome at the same time, it forms an association between the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. After doing this several times, the dog learns to form an association between the two stimuli. The dog now associates the metronome with the food, so when he hears the metronome, he starts to salivate. After learning occurs, our neutral stimulus is now considered our conditioned stimulus, and it produces a conditioned response of salivation. To summarize, before learning occurs, we have an unconditioned stimulus, which naturally or automatically triggers a response, which is going to be the dog food. We have an unconditioned response, which is just a response that is unlearned and occurs naturally as a result of a stimulus, which is going to be the dog salivating, and we have a neutral stimulus of a metronome. After learning occurs, we have a conditioned stimulus, or a previous neutral stimulus, which has formed an association with an unconditioned stimulus, which is going to be our metronome, and we have a conditioned response, which is just an automatic response to a conditioned stimulus, which is also going to be salivating. Classical conditioning is going to be a learning process of repeatedly pairing a neutral stimulus with a response producing stimulus until the neutral stimulus produces the same response. Pavlov proved that a neutral stimulus could be used to produce a conditioned response in animals but can this be done in humans? In February of 1920, a rather unethical research study conducted by John B. Watson and his assistant, Rosalie Rayner, at Johns Hopkins University. Watson wanted to see if Pavlov's theory of conditioning could be applied to humans to evoke a fear response. Watson exposed a baby around the age of nine months named Little Albert to a series of various stimuli. Albert was shown rabbits, a monkey, different masks, even newspaper on fire. Watson observed Little Albert's reactions to each one of the stimuli just to make sure he did not already exhibit a fear response to the stimulus. Little Albert was eventually shown a rat which he took particular interest in. Watson decided that the rat would be the chosen stimulus for the experiment. The next time Watson showed Little Albert the rat, he paired it with an extremely loud noise. Watson would simply take a hammer and smash it up against a metal pole. Naturally, this loud noise caused Little Albert to cry. So at this point, you may be putting it all together. After several pairings of rat and hammer, Little Albert started to associate the rat with this aversive stimulus. A stimulus that once caused happiness and laughter now immediately produces a fear response. So here on our screen we have a spot for the unconditioned stimulus, we have a spot for the unconditioned response, the conditioned stimulus, and the conditioned response. You'll also notice that there's a spot for these blanks in your review packet. So go ahead, pause the video, and fill those blanks out for the Little Albert experiment. Unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response is going to be what occurs before learning. So before Little Albert was conditioned, what made him elicit a fear response? The loud bang made Little Albert cry. This is a natural reflexive reaction to hearing an aversive stimulus. So our unconditioned stimulus would be the loud noise, while our unconditioned response, or how Albert reacts to the stimuli, is going to be Albert crying. After this pairing happens several times, we can now see that learning has occurred. Albert has now associated the loud noise with the rat. Our conditioned stimulus, which occurs after learning takes place, would be our neutral stimulus of the rat, while our conditioned response is going to be crying. The unconditioned response and the conditioned response is always going to be very similar, if not the same. Little Albert learned the fear response through acquisition, which is just the first stage of learning when a response is established. Through his research, Watson also came up with the idea of stimulus generalization and discrimination. Watson found that after conditioning took place, Albert showed a fear response to stimuli that were similar to the white rat. So all white furry things would elicit a fear response in Albert. A question that often comes up with this study is, did Watson create a long-lasting fear response in Little Albert? Over the next few days, weeks, and even months, Little Albert would return to Watson to have follow-up experiments done. Watson found that after 10 days of initial conditioning, Albert's fear in rats dramatically decreased. This is the idea of extinction or in classical conditioning where a response just dies out when the unconditioned stimulus is no longer present. Today, classical conditioning is still a widely studied concept by behavioral scientists. However, we have learned a lot more about conditioning since the years of Pavlov and Watson. Today, we know that there are some cognitive aspects of classical conditioning that behavioral psychologists may have overlooked. In 1968, cognitive psychologist Robert Rescorla tested the reliability of signals and outside stimuli in how we process classically conditioned responses. In his research, Rescorla had two groups of rats. The control group had a tone paired with a shock. 
The rats would hear the tone and then receive a brief electric shock. These rats formed a strong association between the tone and the shock. The experimental group would receive the same amount of tone shock pairings, but they would also receive extra additional shocks at random times. These rats would not form a strong association between the tone and the shocks because these rats were receiving less reliable information. Rats in both groups were actively processing the reliability of the signals they received, leading to cognitive influences in their conditioning. In the 1950s, psychologist John Garcia tested how the concept of taste aversion was related to classical conditioning. Garcia gave rats flavored water that would make them feel ill, and after the rats recovered, Garcia noticed that the rats would not go anywhere near this flavored water. This is the idea of taste aversion. Garcia's research showed that certain stimuli are much easier to form an association with than others. But why exactly is this? According to Garcia, organisms come equipped with something known as biological preparedness. Biological preparedness is the idea that an organism is innately predisposed to form associations between certain stimuli and responses. This goes against Pavlov's theory on conditioning that states that the unconditioned stimulus must be paired with the neutral stimulus shortly after it is presented. Now on to operant conditioning. In 1898, Edward Thorndike proposed his idea of the law of effect. The law of effect is very simple and straightforward to understand. The law of effect states that behaviors with favorable consequences will occur more frequently, while behaviors with unfavorable consequences will occur less frequently. In 1938, behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner founded the idea of operant conditioning, which is just going to examine how an individual makes an association between a behavior and a consequence. This type of learning differs from classical conditioning. While classical conditioning relies on reflexive responses, Operant conditioning is going to focus on how we make voluntary behavioral changes as a result of environmental consequences. When looking at the difference between the two, ask yourself, is the behavior something that the organism can control? If yes, it's operant conditioning. If no, it's classical conditioning. According to Skinner's theory on operant conditioning, there are four possible outcomes to a behavior. Reinforcement is going to be any consequence that increases the likelihood of the behavior that follows it. Reinforcement will always be a good thing. Positive reinforcement is going to be reinforcement where the individual receives something they want. So if my dog Stark sits when I ask him to, I give him a treat. This treat acts as reinforcement for Stark to follow his command and sit. Stark is being given a reward which will increase his likelihood to follow this command in the future. Negative reinforcement is also a type of reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is not a bad thing. I feel like I have to repeat that. Negative reinforcement is not a bad thing. One more time. Negative reinforcement is not a bad thing. The word negative in this setting refers to an aversive stimuli being subtracted or taken away in order to reinforce or strengthen a desired behavior. Now let's talk about Teddy. I don't want to leave him out. When I first got Teddy, he would sleep in the crate or be crated when he was home alone. As his behavior got better, he would spend more and more time outside of the crate. The better Teddy acts outside of the crate, the less time he spends inside of the crate. We are taking away crate time, something Teddy probably doesn't like because he's doing a good job. We are reinforcing this behavior. On the opposite end of reinforcement, we have punishment. While reinforcement is meant to strengthen a behavior, punishment is going to try and stop a behavior from reoccurring. Just like reinforcement, punishment can be either positive or negative. Now I know the term positive punishment does seem to contradict itself, but you just have to look at it as punishment by application. All positive punishment is going to mean is that something is going to be added to the environment that the organism does not like in order to stop a behavior from reoccurring. When Stark was a puppy, I let him sleep on my bed with me one day, and I woke up after my glorious nap and found out that he went to the bathroom and right on my sheets. I told Stark, bad dog, and made him go outside. Lesson learned. This is considered positive punishment. I added something to Stark's environment, a verbal reprimand, to try and stop this behavior from occurring again. Negative punishment is going to be punishment that results in something the organism likes being taken away. Teddy loves playing with his dog toys, but sometimes he's a little too aggressive with them. Negative punishment, or punishment by removal, would be me taking away a toy, something Teddy likes, in order to get him to stop destroying them. Psychologists generally agree that reinforcement is better for behavior retention over punishment, but there are some times where punishment might be necessary. Punishment can be beneficial if it comes immediately after the undesirable behavior has been displayed and if it is consistent and not occasional. Just like classical conditioning, operant conditioning will also include generalization and extinction. It's also going to be important for us to distinguish between primary reinforcers and secondary reinforcers. Primary reinforcers are going to be our biological reinforcers. 
so anything related to food, drink, and pleasure. Most human reinforcers tend to be conditioned or secondary reinforcers. Secondary reinforcers are reinforcers that have been associated with a primary reinforcer. Secondary reinforcers are things such as good food and drinks, going to work for a paycheck, or buying new cool clothes. Through his research, B.F. Skinner was able to have mice click on a button after hearing a sound go off, and even had pigeons direct missiles shot from airplanes. How exactly was Skinner able to reinforce behaviors that he could not communicate? Well, he used the concept of shaping. An example of shaping could be me trying to teach Stark to roll over. Every time Stark gets closer to the desired behavior, I give him a treat. The theory is that by reinforcing approximate behaviors, the desired behavior will eventually be reached. Reinforcement can also be done through the use of various reinforcement schedules. This is when reinforcement will not be given after every appropriate response. This is done in order to cut down on extinction of reinforced behaviors. To start, we have fixed ratio, where reinforcement is given after a set number of correct responses. An example of this could be, for every 10 visits to your local sandwich shop, your 11th visit, you get a free sub. Variable ratio is when reinforcement is given after a random number of correct responses. When someone goes to a slot machine, this is the schedule of reinforcement that is being used. They know if they keep playing that they'll eventually win but how much and when will that be? Nobody knows. Variable ratios of reinforcement can be used to explain things like gambling addiction. Fixed interval is a schedule of reinforcement that reinforces after a set period of time. If I give you a pop quiz at 3 o'clock every Friday, this would be considered a fixed interval schedule. Chances are the closer we get to Friday, the more of this behavior or studying you will do. And last, we have variable interval, which is going to reinforce behavior over a random, unpredictable amount of time. If I were to tell you that pop quizzes were fair game at any time, chances are you would be studying more often to prepare for the uncertainty of the quiz date. So how exactly do we differentiate from these reinforcement schedules? Ask yourself, if I were doing this task, could I speed up reinforcement by doing the behavior more often? If the answer is yes, it's going to be a ratio schedule. And if the answer is no, it will be an interval schedule. Today, psychologists have discovered that there is much more to operant conditioning than what Skinner initially thought. The overjustification effect occurs when an expected external incentive, such as money or prizes, decreases someone's intrinsic motivation to perform a task. Learned helplessness is a condition when an organism suffers from a sense of powerlessness arising from traumatic events or persistent failure to succeed. Learned helplessness is thought to be one of the underlying causes of depression. With technology, we now know today that operant conditioning does have some biological aspects. The idea of biological predisposition is that it's easier to train a behavior in an organism that are closer to natural behaviors using natural reinforcers such as food. There is also this idea of instinctive drift. This is where a naturally occurring behavior is going to interfere with operant responses. Next up, we have cognitive learning. In 1961, cognitive psychologist Albert Bandura hypothesized that learning can also occur through observation. This went directly against what Skinner hypothesized, stating that all learning was a result of conditioning and environmental consequences. To prove his theory, Bandura would have children placed in a small room where they would observe an adult attack a large bobo doll. The adult was basically modeling behavior for the children. A control group of children did not see the adult attack the doll. The children were then individually placed in a room with hundreds of toys and were secretly being observed by the researchers. Bandura's hypothesis was proven correct. Children who observed aggressive adult behavior also acted aggressively towards the doll. Children who did not observe the adult attacking the bobo doll did not show aggressive behavior towards a doll when placed in the room with the toys. This data gave Bandera the foundation for his social cognitive theory of learning. The social cognitive theory of learning basically states that learning can occur as a result of watching, imitating, and modeling behavior. The observer does not have to perform any observable behavior or receive any reward. To successfully learn through observation, Bandura stated that you have to first pay attention to the behavior, then this information has to be encoded into your memory, you have to be able to mimic or reenact the behavior, and finally you have to have the motivation to want to do the behavior. There has to be something in it for you. There is biological proof to support Bandura's theory. When hooked up to a brain scan, we see that when someone's observing a behavior or an action, mirror neurons are activated. These mirror neurons create similar synaptic connections that are made when actually performing the behavior, therefore strengthening the behavior. Other aspects of cognitive learning involve Edward Tolman and his research on latent learning. Latent learning is just going to be learning that occurs without any obvious reinforcement that the behavior has been learned in the first place. Allowing mice to aimlessly explore a maze for days with no external reward, Tolman found that the mice created a cognitive map of the maze. The learning was occurring, but there were no observable traits to show for it, going against what Skinner and Watson believed. 
In round two, the mice were then placed in that same maze, but this time a treat was placed at the end to act as reinforcement. These mice were timed against a control group of mice who did not have time to explore the maze beforehand. Even when the quickest route was blocked off, the mice who had time to explore the maze previously would consistently score better times than the control group. So an example of latent learning. If I'm teaching you a psychological concept, you may learn this concept, but not show any observable proof that you did learn this concept until it becomes relevant for you, like answering a test question. And last, we have Wolfgang Kohler and insight learning. Insight learning is going to refer to the sudden realization of the solution to any problem without repeated trials or continuous practice. In the late 1920s, Kohler was studying the behavior of chimps with his test subject, Sultan. Kohler placed a banana outside of Sultan's cage right out of reach. Kohler gave Sultan two poles that by themselves could not reach the banana, but if joined together, could. After several unsuccessful attempts, Sultan decided to give up until by accident he joined the two sticks together. Like a light bulb going off in Sultan's head, he immediately dashed over to where the banana was and was able to retrieve it using the conjoined sticks. The sudden burst of insight in solving a problem is what Kohler referred to as insight learning. All right, well that does it for our unit four review on learning. As always, be sure to complete the review section at the end of each unit to make sure you are keeping up with all the topics that we went through. Remember, you can always go back and watch previous unit review videos if you need a refresher on any course content. And on that note, it looks like my ride is here. Peace!